here's a demo of another kind of crossing question. We're going to go with aliens, and uh, we don't know an awful lot about them, but I can tell you that we uh, can read through this and make some assumptions. I'm telling you at first, uh, of course, that uh, they are going to use the same genetics as animals, um, so we can make the same kinds of assumptions that we would for a regular uh, tri-hybrid cross. They're diploid, so you know that they probably undergo some kind of sex. We don't know if they're hermaphroditic, but we do have individuals that can contribute gametes to each other. Um, we are going to start with true breeding individuals who are diploid. So that means that the F1s that we generate from these are going to be heterozygous. And we will use a test cross so that we can see the kind of chromosomes that are provided from that heterozygote. Uh, now the F1 is particularly important because it shows what's dominant. My usual advice with this kind of question is to assume that the mutations are recessive because often mutations involve the loss of the function of a gene and if you have two copies, a, a wild type working one and a loss of function, sometimes the wild type working one can compensate making the mutation recessive. In this case we don't know enough about our aliens so let's just go with a convention that says we'll name each trait after the recessive character. So here are some data for us. We've got the crosses of the aliens and maybe at this point I'll be quiet for a minute. I'll let you uh, pause and think about what you would do next before I show you. So maybe that's enough time. Uh, what do these data indicate to us? Well, the first thing is we probably want to use each trait in turn and try to figure out what's dominant and what's recessive. Now in the F1s, I told you in the preceding slide that the pear-shaped head is dominant, so that means that the round head, which wasn't mentioned, has to be the recessive one. That's a reasonable inference. So if we're going to name it after the recessive trait, we have round head, and I'm going to use RND to name that locus, and RND plus is going to be the pear-shaped head. Notice that because I've gone with the plus and no plus nomenclature system that I'm going to use a lower case for the mutant name. That means that the mutation is recessive and whenever we're homozygous recessive the alien will have a round head. Whenever you see the plus sign you just sort of think about it and switch what you're thinking and go with the um, uh, the pear-shaped head in that locus. Uh, the fingertip was uh, normal in our F1s. The glowing fingertip, I assume uh, uh, ET style is the glowing fingertip and so we'll name it the, uh, the appropriate way here with GL plus, GLW plus being normal and GLW being glowing and finally we've got gray skin and grease, green skin and the F1s were gray so that makes the dominant trait so we're going to go with GRN as our uh, our mutant our, our locus name. Okay now two things to notice here is uh, we have written down two very large groups We've got 506 and about equal magnitude is 491. That's going to tell us that these are probably the parentals. These are probably the true breeding ones that we started out with in the parental generation. That means that the, uh, the F1 hets are going to have one chromosome from one parent and one chromosome from another and you'll see why that's important in a minute. We want to figure out gene order, so we look at this other number that I put triangles around. These triangles indicate that these are the smallest groups, and these are going to represent the double recombinants, the double crossover ones. That's why they're so rare. Now, this is the same uh, table with some of the gene symbols that I just threw up there so we can remember. And let's start with looking at the genotype of the F1. And I'm doing this in a way that's different from a lot of textbooks. I'm going to draw these loci names one on top of the other because I don't want to imply an order for these. So I don't know what order they're in. I, I do see that in the, um, in the table we've got <clears throat> the, the, the traits listed one after the other, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily found that way on the chromosome. So how can we test that? Well, let's make a hypothesis. Let's propose that this order on the table is indeed the correct order, and so I'm going to put glow in the middle because glow is the fingertip phenotype and that's found between the other two. So let's see if that works, and I put a nice big question mark here to remind me that this is um, a hypothesis. Now I highlighted through to show what a double crosser would give me. If I have a crossover between round and glow and another one between glow and green, that's a double crossover and that's going to give me my recombinant chromosome like this. Now because this is a test cross that we're looking at, 
uh, we know that the test cross parent is recessive for all traits, so the dominant trait here would show up in the, in the head. So we would have a pear-shaped head, because that's what R and D plus means according to our symbols right here. We have a glowing finger and we have a gray skin. That's what GRN plus means if we refer over here. So does that correspond with one of these two? So let's uh, check them out. Well, it turns out we the one that has a pear-shaped head has a normal fingertip. So we can't accept this. We're going to say that glow can't be in the middle. Another way we could do this is to just move another trait into the middle. So let's, uh, in this case, throw the alien skin color in the middle. And so we've got uh, round green glow. Notice that this is the same genotype as in our original F1, so we're testing this out. And then when we uh, check through it, we find out that indeed, when we do a crossover, we get RND plus, GRN, GLW plus, and that's pear green normal finger, and that fits with one. We can also do the converse. We can do round with um, gray and glow, and round glow gray is the same as round gray glow, that they both work. So we're going to accept this as the gene order. Now that we know the gene order, we can go and map these. Now, a lot of textbooks say go ahead and map them all, and that's fine. You can look at the distance and fit them together. That's not incorrect. And uh, for my students, I'm not going to mark you down if you use a different way. Uh, I do think it's nice to know the order using a non-mathematical method because if you make a mathematical error, you can see that uh, if you already know the order, that they don't fit and that you can go back and revise your answer. Um, but some people would prefer to go with the math. That's okay. Either one is good. Now I've put over here in the corner shorthand to reflect the proper order of the genes that I've got over here. And I think this is another good reason to figure out the gene order. I know green's in the middle, so the way you should read this, if I have a plus, that just means it's RND plus, because my writing, as you can see, is a little sloppy. So the plus sign up here means that we have a pear-shaped head, and if you look over, it says pear-shaped head there. And everywhere you see a pear-shaped head, you're going to get a plus in the first column. If you have a round head, you get RND in the first column. In the second column, GRN is referring to the green skin, so we are looking at the final entry in the column, but it is the middle gene, and that's why I've got this here. If you're green, you get GRN. If you're gray, you get a plus. Green, gray is plus, green is green, gray is plus, and so on and so forth, and you can figure out the last column for yourself. Now why this is so useful is when we look at our parental versions, and I've put in a nice faint P highlight here, these are the biggest numbers, and we can look at the way the genes are oriented with respect to each other. I call this where the dominants are together as coupling, and if we have a dominant and a recessive, that's dominant is plus, that's a recessive, that's called repulsion. And if you have two recessives together, that's, that's going to be called coupling. So coupling, coupling, repulsion, repulsion. So those are the words I'm going to use when I describe this. Now the trick here is to look at loci one at a time. So I'm only looking at these first two columns and I've put a box around them. I've got a coupling configuration in this parent and I've also got a coupling configuration in this parent. This is absolutely how it should be. They should never be different from each other. Now what we need to do is look at this region and I want to give it a name. So I'm going to look in region one which I've indicated with this light green um, arrow here, and I've circled the ones that show in region one a repulsion configuration, which is different from coupling. Notice I didn't touch this one or this one because these are parental. So I found out how many recombinants there are for region one. Now I've written down a little Roman numeral one to show me which numbers correspond to a crossover in region one. Now, if we look over here, we see again coupling configuration. doesn't have to be this way in every genetics question, but uh, that's how I've done it. Um, and if we do a box around the other parental and circles around the, recomb uh, the recombinants, notice I've got a circle here. We've got repulsion, 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 repulsion. That's different from the coupling configurations in region two. So I've put number twos by those that have a circle around them. So now I know where my crossovers are. Now here's the easy part. We just plug these in. Uh, when you're told to show your work, you should put down a formula so every, the instructor or everyone else knows how you're figuring out uh, the math. And we're just going to put down the total number of recombinants over the total progeny. So what we have here is the sum of all of those different progeny. Now, when we plug in the numbers, so I went too fast here, let me back it up one. Uh, here we've got uh, the distance from round to green, that's my no, 
um, my way of saying I'm just looking at region one. You could put a little num Roman numeral one there, I suppose. That'd be easier. I should have done that. Uh, I've got 91, which is by that green letter one, number one, with one, with one, with 85. 91 to one to one to 85 times 100. And if you work it out, uh, you should get 178 over 1188. And that's 14.98 centimorgans, not centimeters. You could use map units. Um, you should check with your instructor, but I'm good with either. And here's another locus. This is region two. I should have done it in orange, I think. Um, everywhere there's a two, we're gonna put the number down. Six to one to one to seven, six to one to one to seven. You add those up. Uh, and divide by 1188, multiply by 100, and you're going to come up with about 1.26 centimorgans of distance. Now, there's a mathematical trick that I uh, encourage my students to use, and that is to calculate the distance from each far end. We're going, we're going to go from round to glow, so that's what I've got, round to glow here. Now, in some textbooks, they'd say just look at the outermost um, genotypes. And so if we just look at the outside two, okay, so here's our parental. We've got a plus sign here and a plus sign and a round and a glow. So if they're in coupling, they're normal or they're um, parental. And if they're in repulsion, they're recombinant. So here we see uh, repulsion. That's good. Here we see repulsion. That's good. Here we see coupling. Wait a minute. There are crossovers here. There's two crossovers. Notice that the first crossover sort of negates the second. So this looks like a coupling configuration, and our data are now wrong. Now, if we look here, we've got round and, and glow. Uh, these are also in coupling, and we wouldn't ordinarily pick them up if we're going to look for recombinants. So that's the danger of just calculating, just uh, looking at pairwise genes without figuring out which one goes in the middle. And I think I said the data were wrong before, but they, they won't be wrong. They're, they're your data. Uh, but we, we want to accommodate these extra crossovers in here. So watch how I do this. I'm going to add up all the single crossovers. So looking down here at the bottom, I've got 916785. That refers to, stop it, oh, my pe pencil gave away the answer. 916785. But when we deal with these really rare ones, these are double crossovers, so down here I'm going to multiply them by 2. So those one plus one single uh, double crossover units actually count as four crossovers total because it's two times the two organisms that have them. So when you add those up and put it in the formula, you get a number that's 16.25. Now here's how you use that number to make sure you didn't make a mistake. We're going to draw a line for a chromosome map. And we're going to put in the first locus on the far left. Don't put in your middle locus because proportionately it should be closer to one side than another because these are very different numbers. So I'm going to put round and glow and I'm going to slide in the green middle gene really close to glow. This isn't actually very good because it's not totally to scale but it certainly is better than someone putting it right in the middle and we'll draw in our numbers to see what they are. So 14.98 to 1.26 these are the numbers we had before and the distance from the farthest most genes I'm going to put here. Now if we add up that distance and that distance, that gives us 16.24 and that correlates very well with what we calculated for the with the double crossover correction. So this is a trick you can use to make sure you didn't make a mathematical error. So this uh, map makes sense and we're going to use it. Now I'm going to finish off by calculating interference. So I've left my genetic map up here and I should have left the uh, distances um, between these. And when I look, I've got a formula here, interference is equal to 1 minus C. Now C is the coefficient of coincidence, and that's the ratio of observed numbers of crossovers divided by the, experiment, uh, the expected number. So the observed number is 1 plus 1. It's these two guys right here. The expected one is a product of the recombination frequencies. This is region 1. Remember it was 14.98, but we're going to call it 0.1498. And the reason is that this has to be a decimal, a fraction. And this was 1.26, so expressed as a decimal, it's 0 0.0126. You multiply those together to get the proportion of the progeny that should be double recombinants. When you multiply that proportion by the total number of progeny, that's going to give us 2.42 expected recombinants. And it looks pretty close. We only saw two, but we'd expect 2.2. Again, this is, since this is math, we're talking about you know a quarter of a fly here, which, or alien, sorry. I've been doing too much genetics. We'd expect a quarter of an alien. Maybe they can do that. I don't know. They're aliens. But the number I have right here 
is 0.89, which tells me I saw 89% of the ones that we expected. So when we run that back through the original formula up here, it's 1 minus 0.89, and that means that 11% of the expected number of double crossovers did not occur. Uh, what that means is having a crossover in region 1. I'm going to try to draw with this. This computer doesn't do too well with the, the drawing. If we've got our chromosome here and we've got our three loci, I won't try to write the names in. If we have a crossover going on in this region, it's going to take enzymes. They're going to be working on that region. And then to be able to fit another enzyme in here to allow very precise crossing over the genetic material is less likely because of a crossover here. So that's called positive interference. You can see why I don't want to write. Positive interference. If we had a larger, oh darn, well, I'll leave it at that. If we had a larger number of the uh, ex uh, observed number, that would be negative interference, which means that a crossover in one region will actually cause more crossovers to occur in the other. Positive interference is not super common, but it has been observed. Um, so there you have it. Uh, I should have stopped a few more times and given you a chance to, to come up with your own conclusions, uh, but hopefully that's a helpful uh, exercise.